Amen. I'd like to preach you the message, the stewardship of your temple. The stewardship of your temple. It's one of the messages in our series, the framework of the Christian life. Let's begin, please, with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here in your house this morning. We beg you, Lord, that you would let the word of God come in a very powerful way as we realize that we're not only just in the house of the Lord in this church, but we are the temple. And uh, help us to understand what that means and the many things that you've written um, about uh, our earthly bodies in, in the scriptures. And Father, we just need you. We thank you for the great uh, just moving in our hearts already through the music and, and for the things that have happened already. It's been very good to be here so far. And let the word of God dwell richly in us, please. I love you. We reach out to you. As a choir sing, we yearn for you. There's a great yearning in our hearts for you. And Father, I just pray that, uh, that you would just work in a great way. In Christ's name, amen. You know, this is not part of the service, but C.S. Lewis said something like this, or some part of the sermon. He said something like this. So if you find in your heart, in your life, a yearning uh, for something that this, this world cannot satisfy, it's just very obvious that you've been created for a different world. That's good. It's very good. Framework of the Christian life. Progressive Christian growth after a, a man, a woman comes to Jesus Christ, the Lord for salvation. It's called sanctification. What happens after that? It's not just a ticket and, hey, we'll see you later. The Lord begins working in your life, uh, transforming you into his image. It is the work of God changing us into the image of Christ faithfully day after day as we look into the word and especially as we look on the glories of Jesus Christ. We are transformed, the scripture says, into glory, into glory. That's where the action is, okay? That's what we're talking about. That's what we are yearning for the Lord to do with us right now. But the scripture has in, in the middle of that, or understanding as that is going on, this true life change in you, this true God change in you, there are certain frameworks of, or structures that God builds that real growth upon. Let's think of it this way, I've said this before, but kind of like molds that you, that you lay in order to, to pour a, a, a foundation or, or sidewalk of concrete Maybe like those, those uh, metal rings that you put around your tomato plants so that the, grows will, the, the vines will grow the right way. Frameworks. A framework is a structure upon which something is grown or built. And in the scripture, we see many of these frameworks. And I'm not trying to add to God's word. I just, these are things that I have observed there, okay? And many times those frameworks are like allegories. They come forward in an allegory in some way. That we are a body, for instance. And uh, that, you know, the greater body of Christ, the universal body of Christ, uh, saints of all ages. But then the picture, the snapshot of us being members, you know, fingers and toes and nose and eyebrows and things in the local body of Christ. You know, so we saw, you know, the idea there of a body. Uh, we also saw that we are stewards. You know, the allegory of us being stewards or, or that we're like land managers and we have all of these things that, that we are set forward to, to manage or God has given to us or loaned them to us or entrusted to us in, in order to be stewards of, we will see that we're going to, in the future, that we are soldiers. And so all of these frameworks, these, and I hope that helps clarify a little bit what I mean by framework, all of these kind of frameworks are, are things where our Christian life are built around or upon or what the Lord tells us about. We've We've landed right now in stewardship and being stewards of our time. We saw that, our talents and spiritual gifts. We saw our treasure and today, our temple. That's a nice tea, but it's also something that we have been given. This body of yours, stewardship of the temple of our bodies. Take your Bibles and turn to the first book of the Bible, Genesis 1. A great starting place when we understand that we have been given bodies. Uh, created bodies to to manage, to be stewards of. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse number 26. Genesis 1, beginning in verse number 26. I just want to tell you that there are two passages today that we'll turn in our Bibles to. You're welcome to turn in all the rest, but a topical message like this, um, there are going to be several passages of Scripture that we will cover, and we are, try we are trying to make it 
helpful to you and to stay on track and to be focused. And it will be up here on the screen so you can turn in your Bibles or your devices or whatever when we come to those. But we want you to see the points out of the Word of God. So would you stand? Genesis 1, beginning in verse number 26. Genesis 1, 26 says this. And God said, let us. Do you see that us there, Trinity? Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them, that's a man and woman. Obviously, he knew there'd be future. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. Wow. I mean, we heard that before, but wow. In the image of God created he him. Male and female, female created he them. Turn the page to 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were billions of years. <laughs> Not a bit. Not on your life. And by the way, look up here. The Lord knew that this great heresy of evolution would come about. This, this theory, this false, you know, even theistic evolution, this whole whatever. And so he very particularly through these chapters talks about evening, morning, you know, like we would, like days. So we would understand their they're days, literal days that have a morning and an evening. So look at the last phrase there. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. You may be seated. Understanding how to take care of our bodies that the Lord has given us for his glory begins with a solid understanding that humanity was made, was created at a defined point on the sixth day of creation by God Almighty, particularly by the hand of, or excuse me, particularly by Jesus Christ, okay? By Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity. You know, we see that in John 1, 1 John 1 also. We, we understand how to take care of our bodies starts by understanding that the Lord created us in his very image, in his very likeness. Okay? We are not like monkeys, apes, whatever. We are not like them. We are created in the image and the likeness of God. Now, I cannot explain to you, and it's a whole other sermon, of how people who are created with physical bodies are made in the image and likeness of spirit, of God. Spirit. God was a spirit until Bethlehem, Jesus Christ, second person, came and took on flesh, okay? So I can explain that, you know, the characteristics, there are, you know, all kinds of things we talk about, you know, soul, spirit, these kind of things. This is not the point for here, just what we need to understand is understanding how we take care of our bodies. Start with understanding that God, the designer, made us in his image and in his likeness. And so it matters how we take care of ourselves. Our bodies are not random acts of evolution or animals, the development. We are made with love and purpose and design in the image of Almighty God and in his likeness. Verse 31 then says about that, as well as it says about other cre creation, it was very good. Not just good, God says it was very good that mankind took a body, was given a body, made in the image and likeness of God. I don't know who you think you are. I don't mean that smart aleck. I mean that by you looking and peering into your own life, what you, what you value about yourself or what you think you are. I don't know what you think you are or the disappointment that you may have about your own significance or respect or disrespect of your own body, but God does not make junk. And you're made in his very image and likeness. He is the creative creator. You know, we talk about some people are very creative. Okay, that doesn't even, it's not even the same sentence with the creativity of God that he has. He is the creative creator, and he never made two people alike, and you are an amazing, unique creation to him. You are in his image. Your creation is very good, and I would add simply amazing. 
as someone who sees the word of God and what it says about our bodies and the fact that we have them, I would add that we were all, we are all made amazing. Psalm 139, the author, a child of God, writes, he is glorying in the first part of the, of the chapter about, he's glorying about how he, since he knows the Lord, since he is a child of God, how he never can, can be out of the presence of God, that God's presence is with him uh, everywhere. The, the word, that idea was too wonderful for him. And then he says these things. He says, for thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. This is talking about a baby formed in the mother's womb. This is talking about, you know, there is a, there is a, there is a bad there is a bad philosophy in Christianity going around right now. It's right now in some churches, in some very good churches, but that God is somehow distant, and, and he just gives us his word, and then everything else is liberty, and he doesn't interfere in our lives, or he doesn't come close to us in any way. That's junk. That's not true. The Lord saw us in our mother's womb. Thine eyes, verse 16, did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there were none of them. This is, this is God's great engineering design book. Verse 17, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, and the grammar is toward me, not that I'm thinking about God. Oh God, how great is the sum of them, thoughts that you think toward me. From Adam and Eve, even after the fall of man, because some would argue my opening statement in Genesis 1, being very good, would just, uh, you know, would just have to do with Adam and Eve before the fall. No, here, Psalm 139 is obviously after a fall, the creation of every human being has been amazing. God knew us from our mother's womb. Not only did he know us, but he says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and our creation to him was marvelous. The word of God. Verse 15 and 16 says that not only did God see our unformed substance in our mother's womb, but he had all of our parts written in his book. He wrote down in his design book our parts before they ever came together. That's why abortion is from hell. Or one of the reasons. The last verse says that he is thinking a great sum of thoughts toward us. And he has been since our mother's womb. And the author concludes that that is precious. That is precious. And the discussion of being, folks, a good manager this morning, a steward of your body, has to begin with you understanding that your design, your body, was designed by God to be amazing. And to him, your created body is very, very good, whether you look like a model or not. You know, we can't all look like me. I can't believe I said that. I can't. <laughs> it was just temptation in the pulpit, and I had to say it. You may not be a 10 in any way. You need to consider, however, that you're made wonderfully and marvelously in the image and in the likeness of God. You need to consider that. You need to believe that. You need to allow the word of God to saturate your heart with even your own view of significance and value of your own body. It is God's will that you are who you are physically. It is not just the will. It is the design of God that you are who you are. And he is a pretty good designer. Let me say it this way. It is not healthy or biblical to look in the mirror and to allow yourself to say, I hate myself. I can't stand my nose. I can't stand my hair. I can't stand becoming obsessed with imperfections by the, uh, of your own weight, for instance, or of your nose or your wrinkles or your shape or your lack of shape. It is not biblical or righteous or sane or okay with God. For you to look in the mirror at something that he said is very good and he created in his likeness and his image in his great incredible book your members were written and say you hate it. 
it is not in any way appropriate or reality. In a day that puts so much value on self-respect and esteem, many, many are hurting because they can't stand themselves. Listen, at the creative level, the value of your body comes from who designed it. His opinion that it is very good. And frankly, the incredible pattern of his image and likeness that you came from. That's your significance. And that is your value. Not the fact that Seventeen Magazine says blank about a girl, how a girl should be. Or Vogue. Or whatever. Or Hollywood. Or wherever they're designing things. Los Angeles. Wherever. Not the fact that you can't go to the mall and find things that fit you the right way because they're all designed for supermodels, etc. Your value comes at the creative level from the who that made you and the how in his image and in his likeness. So reject the lies of how you hate yourself and let's start talking about how to be a good steward of the amazing body that God gave you. Let's start honoring the designer. Don't try to, to value yourself with society standards or comparisons to other people. I wish I was like her. I wish I was like him in some way. Find your significance in your designer and rest. 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 Praise the Lord for who he made you to be in his sovereignty and in his phenomenal design. And with that as an opening then, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The land of this passage for the remainder of the message will come back to it several times, even as we use verses in between. Mr. Green, it's great to see you here. Amen. Everybody else that's here too. <laughs> Mr. Green has been rehabbing. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse number 12. It says this. All things are lawful unto me. And by the way, look back at verse number 11. I don't want to yank this out. It's talking about being washed and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay. So then verse 12 through 20 starts talking about our physical bodies. It says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Verse 13, meats for the belly and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Meats like whatever you can bring into your life, you know, whatever you can experience, the pleasures, whatever. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. And the Lord's not, or excuse me, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord, he, he resurrected him, and will also raise up us, that is our body, by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I take the, the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot, a hooker? God forbid. What? Know ye not that, that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. We'll talk about that in a moment. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? which ye have of God, that ye are not your own, you're bought, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Here, here are, uh, you know, a rather awkward discussion of what you're going to do or allow your body to do. It's about your body. It's a very awkward discussion. Verse 13, meats for the belly and the belly for meats. Look there, that was a very old saying, which basically means YOLO. All right? It's do whatever you want to do. For you older people who are not connected to the, the youth culture, that means YOLO means what? Yell it out. What is it? You only live once. Some of you old people are connected. Yay, you go. All right? YOLO, you only live once, so, like, you know, send it up. Get involved with whatever pleasures your body can get. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. Live for pleasure. Live for food. Live for fornication. Do whatever you want. God says immediately, no, that's wrong. 
Your body is for the Lord, not, not for all these pleasures, not for fornication and for, for gluttony and these kind of things. Since you've been saved by Jesus, you are a member of Christ in verse number 15. Why would, you, why would a member of Christ hook up with a harlot? Why would you want to use your body that way since you are connected to Christ? Also, verse 14, I think this is a great point. Our bodies are going to be resurrected and going to be glorified. Why would you take a body which is going to be glorified and do wicked things with it now? Okay, you know, our bodies are intended. In, in, they are going to be reconstituted into glorified bodies, and it matters how you use them now as a steward. Now look again then at verse 19 and 20. It says, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy, Holy Ghost which is in you? which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It's possessive. This is the second time, folks, in 1 Corinthians where the scripture says that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The first time is in 1 Corinthians 3.16, and you're welcome to look back at that. But what does that mean, that our bodies are the temple? Well, when we consider what we are going to allow our bodies to do, how you're going to use this vehicle that the Lord has given you, he's saved you, your spirit's inside, you know, looking out the windshield of your eyeballs, how are you going to use this vehicle? When you consider what you're going to allow your body to do, you need to, to consider that if, you, if we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he has saved us and made us born again and the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, really God has come to indwell us. You've heard that, some of you, for 60 years. Now hear it fresh. When you were saved, God came to reside inside your body. That's mind-blowing. That's craziness. It's the wonderful word of God. The Holy Spirit moved inside our bodies and made them the houses of worship. Made us temples to the Lord. A place individually. Yes, you're in the house of God. The New Testament, Old Testament and New Testament says. But when you leave this place, you, the Lord still resides as a place of worship in you. You're his temple. Our bodies really are doubly, doubly to the property of God who has loaned them and trusted them to us first They are his possessively by creation, the fact that he created us. And secondly, we are his because he saved us. If we are saved here this morning, if you are saved, you are doubly his possession. You are his temple. And I want to just hit the pause button right here and just say this. The greatest thing on this earth is to believe that God loved you so much that he killed his son instead of you on that old rugged cross. For all of your sin, Jesus Christ had to be killed in your place. Substitution. It's not a hard thing to understand at all. Jesus Christ in love laid himself down on that cross for you. To understand that he was making a way for you to be forgiven of your sin by punishing someone instead of you, that is his only perfect son. 1 Peter 3.18 says it this way, For Christ hath all... Christ also hath once suffered for sins. The just, that's him. For the unjust, that's me. That he might bring us to God. And he might be the open door, the bridge, the channel that brings us to God. There's no other way except through the punished, killed, sacrificed, laid down son of God on that tree for you. But all those that believe that Their sins are washed away, that he would bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened or made alive by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. He came up out of that grave. He is the victor over it. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We preached on that last Sunday night. And I just want to say to every person in this place here today, if you cling to the ownership of your body to continue to live in your sin, if you cling to the ownership of your own body to continue to live in sin, you will lose your life forever in a place called hell. However, if you lose your life right now and repent from your sin and give your life to Jesus Christ, believe what he did on the cross and by his resurrection for you, you will gain your life forever and ever in heaven. Give your life to Jesus now when you, while you can. You will gain eternal life. Lose your life to gain your life. You gain your life now, you lose your life later. 
These are the words of Christ. Freely run to Christ as we sang and give your life to him. This is the gospel and this is the wonderful news. And listen to me, I want to tell you straight out. The name, the person of our Lord Jesus Christ and the great gospel that he did 2,000 years ago will transform your life. I want to say that straight out. He, there is great transforming power in Jesus Christ. The same Jesus Christ that made dead men alive and blind men to see and sick ladies to raise up is the same Jesus Christ that can transform your life. I will not put our Savior in a box. He'll save your soul and he'll change your life. Run to him. Be saved today if you're not. So when you trust on Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the third person of God, makes you born again. You are in a new family. We're born as children of the devil, the scripture says. You say, what'd you say about me? I said it about me. When we take Jesus Christ, we're born into the family of God. And our bodies become God's temple. And he comes and he, the Holy Spirit seals us into the day of salvation. Until the day we'll see him. He comes and he lives within me. Never leaves again. He indwells me. Never leave me nor forsake me. Always be inside of you. You are then his temple. If then you are his temple... Your body, managing your body, takes on a different thought, a different understanding. So believers, your body is God's temple. You aren't your own anymore. Jesus bought you with the the price of his blood. And and like verse 20 says here, the purpose of your body is to glorify God. Look at verse 20. For you're bought with the price, therefore glorify God. Now what are the last three words? Yell it out. In your body. Now, how can I use my temple to glorify him? I want to share with you four things in the bulk here of the message. Going to be many verses, okay? Just hopefully we can look at them and apply them and see them in the word of God. The The first way to glorify God in your body is to nourish and cherish your body. I'm not talking about self worship here. But the stewardship of the body God gave you. Nourish and cherish your body. Ephesians 5, 28 says in a different context, truth to us about this stewardship of our body. It says, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it. There's our two words, nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For many times as a premarital counselor, I would look at these verses and, and I would kind of say something snarky about men and think that, you know, the, the thing that God was saying was that, that he was telling men to treat their wives uh, like they would treat their own bodies because they're selfish pigs. That's not what is meant here. That's not really what he's saying. It's meant in a good way. This is a positive thing. The way I treat the church, you treat your wife, you treat your wife the way you would nourish and cherish your own body because that's what you do. That's what people who are, who are sound, who are mentally sound, who are spiritually sound, that's what they do. They take care of the bodies that I've given to them. Treat your wives that way is what this word is saying. Don't miss the main context of the verse. It's telling husbands how to treat their wives. And the answer is to love them as they love their own body, nourishing and cherishing. It's not a sinful thing. God wouldn't tell you to treat your wife sinfully the way you're sinning with your love of your body. God had in view the way spiritually healthy, mentally healthy people treat their bodies. A good way to be a steward of your body is to nourish. That means that word means to carefully train it, like the rearing of a child. It's really a child-rearing word, to nourish it. And the second word, cherish, it means to foster it, to warm it, to watch over it. God expects us to watch over our bodies just like we would little children or, for instance, a a chicken who is taking care of her chicks. This is not self-worship, but taking care of yourself and the body God gave you and created, your amazing body. Well, what are the applications then to this, to nourishing and cherishing my body? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Well, you're not supposed to just treat your body in any old, risky, harmful, abusive way. 
You're not supposed to just let go and, you know, whatever. Put it in, in risk or developing habits that are abusive or harmful to your body. You're to take care of your body. God gave it to you. As stewards of, you know, and I'm going to do a time out here. You know, we talk so much about sp- the spiritual side of things that we, we almost not just neglect, we look down at anyone who would talk about, you know, taking care of the physical side of things. Well, the physical side is a spiritual matter too. As stewards of our body, we, we should be eating correctly and in moderation. You'll not hear me pushing special spiritual or Jewish hippie diets on you, okay? I don't. I, I really, you know, the Lord bless all of you who, you know, who think you have the secret to, to change everything by some kind of supplement or whatever. I believe all food is blessed by prayer and to be received as Peter was taught in Acts chapter 10, okay? So please don't take away my shrimp or my lobster or my, my ham, for instance. I really, that's not, you know, it's not just that whatever. I just don't think it's biblical for us to and try to impress, you know, extreme health solutions onto people. I don't, I don't think that that's actually loving or biblical. There's not holy and unholy foods. There are certainly holy, unholy ways to eat. There are certainly unholy amounts of food that can be consumed. Maybe you can just use that in your home now. Honey, that is an unholy amount of food that you have. <laughs> But one of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5 is self-control, temperance. It's the word temperance in our scriptures. I believe a sound standard for eating is moderation and self-control, temperance. All right? My background is Mennonite, and boy, they could really put on a spread. No butter substitutes there, buddy. You're getting straight out of the cow. They really put on a spread. Three out of my four grandparents lived to be very, very old. And the secret, I believe, was moderation and hard work. Balance and hard work. I, uh, my, I wasn't going to tell you this. My, my grandfather, uh, Grandpa Keener, uh, he was a farmer. He worked incredibly hard, and I think we need to preface that with what I'm about to tell you. He worked incredibly hard, and he, to his death, was a very, you know, not slim, but just not a bit overweight. He was just a very, he ate half a dozen eggs every morning for breakfast and a huge bowl of ice cream every night when he went to bed. You say, is that what you're preaching about self-control and moderation? The man worked it off. The man worked incredibly hard as a farmer, okay? And some of these balanced things that you need to understand, or we need to understand, I should say, But I think moderation and self-control is the thing. Eating a natural, moderate, and balanced diet, not some bizarre hippie diet or some wonder secret holistic herb and supplement things that I can take four times a day. Moderation and balance, people. Moderation and balance. Proverbs 23 and verse number one says this. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee. And put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. Okay, the point here is not just gluttony, but the reputation of ourselves. Before, you know, this man, this was a, uh, before a ruler, your testimony and your reputation of yourself as a pig or a glutton in in that kind of situation or in any situation here. So it's, it's gluttony, but it's also testimony. Verse 20 and 21 of that same passage says, Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh, carnivores. Okay, these are riotous. Okay, this sounds to me like a, a Brazilian uh, buffet. Some of you don't know what a churrascaria is. They bring out enough, food, enough meat. I'm telling you what, it's a whole year of meat. And you just riotously eat it. Well, this is not among riotous eaters of flesh. This is not a good thing. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Folks, gluttony is a sin. It's a sin. Type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, cancer, sleep apnea, osteoarthritis, liver disease, kidney disease, etc., etc., all risks 
health risk of being overweight. Directly connected. When the doctor says you should lose a you need to lose a few pounds, you should take that seriously. Begin doing something about it. Walking, exercising, cutting back on food and kinds of food. God gave you an amazing body. Take care of it. It's not just a nagging doctor. It's a spiritual thing. Our bodies are the temple of God. He doesn't need a supersized temple. He needs a healthy one. I want to say one very, very, very important thing. Very important. Not all people are larger because they are being gluttonous or they have been gluttonous. There are often metabolism factors, gland factors, bone factors that are out of your control. We're not all born with a metabolism of being skinny minis, okay? And some, some people really mess that up and don't understand that both ways. There are pencil-thin people that eat like hogs that are sinning gluttons. There are overweight people that hardly eat anything. God knows that about you. And I would again say lovingly to you who struggle because of your metabolism, not because of gluttony, you are created in the image of God. God designed you with your metabolism. Come to peace with it. My heart is broken because there are so many young girls especially that are broken because they don't look like the magazine ads. And they hardly eat anything and they still don't look like the magazine ads or they don't think they look like the magazine ads and they hurt the bodies the Lord gave them and they're not happy and content with what the designer did and their metabolism doesn't work that way. Find your satisfaction and significance in the creator, in the great designer. He made you exactly how he wanted to make you, and it's very, very good. You just have to look at different standards than our society says. Reject pop culture that says you have to be a certain size to be a valuable or beautiful, that's demonic lying junk that makes wonderful young princesses of God feel inadequate and fat and ugly. Reject all of that destructive, satanic culture. Forget being a fashion model and focus your attention on being a faithful model of the Lord Jesus Christ. I like that. I'm going to say it again. Forget being a fashion model and focus your attention on being a faithful model of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's good stuff. Concerning nourishing and cherishing your body again. 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8 says this, But refuse profane and old wives' fables. And exercise thyself rather unto godliness, for bodily exercise profiteth little. Okay, this is not a slam. It is, you know, there is an article. It profiteth a little, or some, a little. It profits. But godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Obviously, in this passage, the big thing is exercising, just like you would get, you know, on the barbells and you get on the weight things and the things and the bow flex and all of that. Exercise, you can tell I just, you know, I'm just a master of those things. You know, Chuck Norris, Lifetime. Okay, anyhow, the, most great, the greatest thing in your life is to exercise yourself into godliness. Taking time, you know, you, you exercise for an hour, taking time an hour with God, an hour with the Word of God, an, a, an hour with prayer, with listening to a sermon, listening to great music. You know, it's obviously better to exercise that way, yet there is, an, there is a point here to be made. There's a point that is made, you know, that, that bodily exercise profits a little. Somewhere around 40, it becomes harder and harder to keep your body in condition. I'm 44. I testified. It takes persistent exercise, and that's a very good thing for the stewardship of your body, not just post-40, but pre-40. I could do much better, but I do hike and walk many miles weekly because A fat preacher is disrespectful to preaching the word of God. I 
Number two, don't use your body for impurity. So, church, so this nourish and cherish, point one. Point two, stewardship. Don't use your body for impurity, for impurity. In the passage we just turned to in 1 Corinthians 6, probably it's still on your lap there. In verse 16, I want to read this. It says, What know ye not that, that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And then it goes on in verse 18, flee fornication, for every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. And this, this passage, there is a very strange and a very unexpected teaching and connection that we would never know had it not been for the word of God about abuse to our body. It says that when you engage in acts of fornication, sex outside of marriage, you are in some way being joined to that other person in the bond that is only intended for marriage. Now let me, let me just say it straight out. And I'll call, you come to my office and we'll argue and fight about it and I'll show you from the word of God. It doesn't mean that if you hook up with a whore that you are married to her. Okay? It doesn't mean that. And some have taken it that way. No, marriage, we had a wonderful marriage or uh, a wedding yesterday here in this building. And under the covenant of of vows between God and before witnesses, they became one, okay? So that, is no, that does not happen just because of sex outside of marriage or here. But it does say that there is this strange bond that is a physical thing that connects you in an unholy way, in a physical way, with your body when you participate in fornication. It goes beyond that to say in verse number 18 that every other sin that you can do is without or outside of your body, but sexual sins are committed against your own body. Now, I understand all of this, but it is the word of God, and it is clear here that, you know, through through several verses, this is laid out for us. This kind of sin is not just spiritual. There is a physical sin element to it. There is an abuse of my body that is beyond normal abuse. And that is sex outside of marriage. It injures me on levels beyond other sins and is terrible stewardship of my, my body. And the word of God says, flee fornication. And in other places, flee youthful lusts. You are God's possession. This is dangerous, dangerous stuff. Beyond just not exercising. Beyond just being gluttonous and overweight. There is impurity. Sex outside of marriage abuses your body in a way that you don't even understand, that only God understands. Fornication abuses you on the deepest levels physically and mentally and emotionally, and like any other sins, every young person in this room, listen to me. This is why you wait for marriage. This is one of the reasons, other than just the command of God, it's not okay to be loosey-goosey. It's not okay to, oh, well, all teens are doing it and participate in sexual things before marriage. It's not okay, and it abuses your body in ways that we don't even understand. You're joined to Christ. Your body belongs to Christ. Don't give it away before marriage. And I would just say to you, I am not presumptuous in any way. I say to all you who are married or, or have been married for that matter, protect your purity. Flee youthful lusts. Number three, don't let sin reign in your body. This is a different thought. Don't let sin reign in your body. Romans 6, 11 says it this way. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. This is Romans 6, 11. But alive unto God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let, and here it is. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Okay, he says mortal to make you understand. I'm not just talking about a Christian thing. I'm not talking about your spiritual life thing. I'm talking about your body, okay? Don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Okay, so this is what are you gonna yield your body to do? To be an instrument, a tool? Some of you have all kinds of tools in your garage, all right? An instrument, a device, Let's put it up to date. An app, okay? Are you going to be an app of sin that reigns in you or an app of righteousness unto God? 
So the verse is talking about sin reigning in your body. Reigning is a, is a king word, you know, to be a dictator, to, to, to have absolute rule. So it's allowed to rule, to reign, some sin or some sins, plural. That is sin ongoing, unchecked, and not stopped. Don't let sin reign. We're talking about the stewardship of our body. We are not to keep yielding our members, our body parts, as instruments of unrighteousness. This speaks of addictions and continual sin habits that are unhealthy for us or that are just sin for that matter. They go unchecked and they reign like a king over us and over our new man and reign over what the Lord has told us and the Holy Spirit that's in us, for instance, being grieved. Don't let it rain. They must be stopped. Ongoing sin habits. Sins of addiction. Excessive drinking rots your liver and confuses your mind. Smoking kills your lungs, your teeth, your throat. Abusing medications, drugs, street drugs, prescription drugs, whatever, gives control of your body to someone other than you and the Lord. Something is reigning in your body other than the Lord. And the word of God says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. You're alive to God in Jesus Christ. You're alive to him. The control is him. The possession is him doubly, creator, savior, doubly his of your body. Don't let anything reign in control of your body but the Lord. Addictions of all types are like that. Excesses of all types allow something to rule other than, than you, your new man, and God. Listen again to verse number 12 of the passage that we're open to, 1 Corinthians 6. It says, all things are lawful unto me. This is how the argument starts. All things are lawful unto me. There may be some things that you do as habits that you begin doing that aren't necessarily absolutely sin issues or controlling issues. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient of how that thing will take over my life. And whether we're talking about prescription drugs or talking about smoking or talking about Candy Crush or Crack Book. Sometimes I have to come off a Crack Book so that it doesn't control me. Some of you say, Crack Book, what's a pastor saying? Facebook. That is addictive a lot. Excesses of all types allow... Something to rule in you other than God. The scripture says all things are lawful for me. I just read this to you, 612. But all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me. And the last part says, in your Bible, look there, 1 Corinthians 612, you're open to it. But I will not be brought under the power of any. I will not be brought in my body under the control of any but the Lord. So if anything else is controlling me, at the beginning it might have started to be lawful and, and okay to me or whatever. But if if it begins taking control of me, I will say no, I will check it, I will, I will take it off of the throne of my life. It will not reign because it's beginning to have power over me. This is talking about your body. A believer, because we are alive to God, wants to be controlled only by the Lord. And there are some things, some habits that, are, that may start out to be lawful, but they do eventually bring you under their power. You lose control to those things. Well, those shouldn't be allowed to reign in your body. Our addictions should only be to the Lord and his control. There's a great passage of scripture about a, a couple, a family in, this, in, in the Bible. They were addicted to the work of the Lord. Now, that's a good addiction, the serving of the Lord. That's a great addiction. And I want you to know that I'm not preaching concerning addictions or whatever out of a condemning, judgmental message Pastor Whitmer's is is better than you because you have an addiction and I don't or anything like that. I know that addictions are terribly hard, but our Bible teaches us the loving, transforming power of Almighty Jesus that sets prisoners free and can do that for you. Cry out to his love and throw yourself on the power of his transformation. And I'm not just speaking, you know, garbly gook. I'm not making you promises that don't have power in the word of God. Jesus is a great transformer. He does set prisoners free. He can and will petition to him. How do you do it? Cry out to Jesus. I don't know. It's his power, not Toby's. The scriptures do talk about the fact 
of not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And talk about the transforming power of changing our mind by giving ourselves to the word and the thoughts of God in the scriptures and the transforming power of that. Let me also say this about taking controlled substances, alcohol, abusing prescription medications, etc., smoking, whatever. The greatest argument, folks, about or against those things in a believer's life isn't this argument that I am making about defiling your temple. The greatest argument about those facts of those controlling uh, substances are that we use them as a substitute for finding our satisfaction, our relief, our comfort, our help in the Lord. Why should a believer not allow themselves to end these addictions, whatever? Because they are cheap substitutes for seeking our satisfaction on this side of glory in the Lord alone. And I want to tell you, and I want to throw out the reputation of God to you. The satisfaction and the comfort that can come from Almighty God is more than that can come from the bottom of a bottle. Amening from an alcoholic. A saved, regenerated new man. Thank you, Christopher. Gloriously born again, gloriously freed from alcohol. In this line of not allowing sin to reign in our bodies, let's, let's talk about stress. If we're going to talk about what hurts our bodies, let's talk about stress. Heart disease, asthma, obesity, diabetes, heart, heart uh, or excuse me, headaches, heartaches, yeah, headaches, depression and anxiety, gastrointestinal problems, Alzheimer's disease, all of these are directly related to continual stress in your life. Folks, we are stewards of our bodies, and we can't afford ongoing stress in the stewardship of how we're taking care of what God created and designed. So we need to be obedient to the Lord, and we need to download our stress onto him, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Casting all your stress, your burdens, your cares upon him, for he careth for you. We must... In addition to that, make margin in our lives and stop taking on more than we should to please people or our job, people around us or whoever. Margin, the distance between things, margin. We must find time to rest and reflect with the Lord. And as I said many, several weeks ago, sometimes the most spiritual thing that we can do is what the Lord did and got away rested and reflected with the Lord, with his Father. In short, you're not more spiritual because you shoulder more, do more, accept more. You may just be killing yourself faster through stress. And I would just say this for some of you are finding your identity in the fact you like when people say, she's a busy person. And you like when they say, he does so much. You know what my identity and your identity needs to be in? The Lord Jesus Christ, the grace that has come upon us. My value is only that the shed blood of Jesus Christ covers me. If, a, if any man glory, let him glory in the Lord, the scripture says. So, you know, some of you, I'm going to give you permission this morning. Permission sounds like this. You don't have to say yes all the time. The stress is literally killing the body that God designed for you. There are many, many other things that I could preach to you this morning about your bodies. Many verses, many thoughts, and I'm sure that I missed some. You're welcome to send me an email, and I'll hit that in part two, like 10 years from now. I think the main points have been made, though. God made you. God bought you. You are his and need to use your body to glorify him. Nourish, cherish your body. Don't use it for immorality. Don't don't let abusive sin reign in it. Instead, use it for good works. And that last part is the the point I'm going to leave you with. We are saved to be zealous of good works toward God and others. And when our body is abused and harmed and hurting 
and taking care and not taken care of and out of shape and overweight that greatly hinders our desire and our ability to do good works for God and others. Not taking care of our physical bodies hinders us loving God and others by good works. We are stewards of the temple, the bodies that the Lord has given us. Would you bow your heads, please, this morning?